Hello and happy Sunday to your friends and neighbors. Welcome. My name is Gerald, pastor of Innovate Christian Community Church in Kannapolis, North Carolina. So glad to be coming to you this, this day, this Sunday, for our Sunday sermon. Uh, we've still been in the, the Red Letter series, focusing on what it is that Jesus says in His Word, what He says about Himself, and what we can learn from Him. Before we get too deep into it, let me remind you that if you want to go deeper with us, we will have a Zoom link in the description of the video, wherever it is that you're finding this, that will link to our Zoom meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. There's so much more behind the scenes of what I can put out here in just a 15-minute, 20-minute, 30-minute, whatever it is sermon that I want to share with you and that you need to know. And if you really want to know who Jesus is, and more about his word, then join us. Again, a bit six o'clock this evening. It'll be linked in the, the description of the video. <laughs> so feel free, no matter who you are, where you are, to join us. It's just an open discussion where you can give us your thoughts. I'll give you my thoughts. We get to ask questions. We get to answer questions. Nobody's put on the spot, though. It's just open dialogue. Before we get into Today's sermon, let us go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing upon His Word. Friends, <laughs> Father God, we give you thanks and praise for this day and for this time together. And as always, Lord, my hope and prayer is that you will speak through me, speak through your Word, reveal only what it is you have in store for us. And may I honor you in the words that I say. And Father, I pray that you open hearts and minds to hear your Word. For it is in your holy name we pray. Amen. So last week we left off with Jesus attending a wedding and we kind of highlighted, you know, the importance of marriage and how it's all through the scriptures, how God relates to us as his bride and as the groom he is. And then we looked at the, the wedding miracle, the wine, the water and the wine, and how Jesus performed what we call a creation miracle because he took what was meant to come forth from the fruit of a vine and made it happen instantly. And then he gave it in abundance as well. I think we, we come up with over 4,000 bottles worth of wine or maybe glasses of wine, whichever is still a huge amount. And the idea being that whatever we give God and whatever we ask Him to bless of ours for His glory and His purpose, He will do abundantly. Now today we jump into the Gospel of Luke. And here we have Jesus traveling back some four miles from Cana back to Nazareth, where He was, was raised and where He came from. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 21. And we find Jesus in the synagogue. And this is actually a place that he, as Luke points out, is normally in attendance at on the Sabbath, as a good Jewish young man should be. So again, it's uh, chap Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 21. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So there is so much <laughs> just in this little bit of scripture here. But again, our focus with the red letters is to try to learn more about Jesus himself. And so we're going to focus primarily on what he says about himself, what he's saying in the, these statements. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. This was a saying that was known for priests or for prophets 
whenever the prophet was about to speak something that God had revealed, they usually said, you know, the Spirit of the Lord has come upon me. And then they make this proclamation of whatever the prophecy is. <clears throat> and it says, because he has anointed me. Speaking of God anointing Jesus himself. Again, anointing means not only to have oil or something like that put on someone or smear something on them. It is a setting apart for a task. The priest would anoint themselves before going into the tabernacle in the Old Testament, before, before offering sacrifices for people before going in and doing so. It is also a sign of protection. Protection as in, you know, a lot of times whenever we look at anointings, we think of anointing for healing, which is very common today. But it's also a anointing for the protection of God to be on the person. And then he tells us that he has a message. He says, to proclaim good news, to proclaim liberty, the recovering of sight, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These are red letters, first off, highlighted in many Bibles as the words of Jesus. But he's delivering a message from the prophet Isaiah that was written 740 years before this date. Let me read you what Isaiah says. In Isaiah 61, As the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, He has set, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities and the devastations of the many generations. So I went ahead and continued on with a little bit of what Isaiah said there because this is found in Isaiah 60 and 61, and maybe a little bit before that, where he is actually, they, the, the people have been in exile for a while. They've had nations come in and destroy their homes and take them captive, kick them out of their homeland, their promised land that God had given them. So everything for them has been destroyed. Their life has been turned upside down. They don't see hope. They don't see justice. They don't see God's mercy and God's favor upon them at this time. And so Isaiah in 1661 gives them the vision as he is prophesying the future Messiah that is going to come about and bring them back to the way that they were before, where they had peace. Bring them a nation where they no longer have to worry about fighting wars, to restore their lands, to restore their, their livelihood. And when Jesus is making this claim in the synagogue, He is making the claim that He is that Messiah that he is bringing to that day these things, that he is here to proclaim liberty to the captives, bring good news to the poor, recovering a sight to the blind, and set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And as we will see more next week, as we jump into the response of the people, whenever he tells them, in his own hometown here, that he is the Messiah. We get to see their response, but we will save that for next week. They would have recognized. Now you may think he picked up the scroll and he flipped it open and found this because it says that he, let me go back to it, 
says he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And so we may look at it like you and I would whenever we're trying to look for a verse in the scriptures and we're going to thumb through and we look for, you know, John chapter 3, verse 16. You know, can you quote it? <laughs> but in this case, Jesus steps into the synagogue and he stands up in a way that the Jewish leaders would have done it at the time, and they may still do a lot of this today. They read through Moses' law, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, of our Bible, and they read it verse after verse after verse. And wherever they leave off, say this, their Sabbath is on Saturday, so say this Saturday, they left off at Isaiah, not, well, won't go to Isaiah, we'll say Moses chapter 10, verse 18, just out of the blue. Whenever they come back together next Saturday, or the next Sabbath, or the next day that they hold, hold synagogue, they will pick it up at that same spot. And they will just continue to read and expound on those scriptures. But also with Moses' writing, they would read from a prophet. And it is very likely, very possible that in this case, you know, it says that they handed Jesus the scroll of Isaiah. It wasn't, he didn't go pick it out. He didn't say, do you have the book of Isaiah or the scroll of Isaiah? They didn't have books at the time. No, they handed him the scroll and it says he un unrolled it and then found where it says. And it is very likely, very possible that that was simply the reading for that day. And how much would we see God at work if that were truly the case? And I believe it was. And then again, it doesn't take away from it if he did look for that specific scripture because he's still speaking of himself. But my bet is that he unrolled it and that just happened to be the scripture for the day which is actually one of their high days, one of their high Sabbaths. It's the second day of atonement, which we're not going to get into all that. But that would have meant a lot for it to be Jesus claiming himself as Messiah, claiming himself to be coming and delivering all this good news, and that Isaiah scripture is coming true today. So that would have really set a lot of people to hope, but also, as we will see next week, a lot of people to be a little bit upset and a little bit questioning who he was saying he was. But we talked about early on when we first looked at Jesus' birth story and then as a young kid and him entering the temple then or the synagogue then and teaching the leaders there as a 12 year old boy and then being amazed at his knowledge. We said then he was on a mission. From day one, God sent him into the world to be on mission. And this, what he announces here, is a huge part, if not his only part, outside of salvation itself, which him being the Messiah means him bringing salvation. It is the work that he is coming to do. And friends, if you and I claim to be followers, to be believers of Jesus, then I've got news for you. This is to be our work as well. The church, big C, church, all Christians should be about doing the same work that Jesus did. We should be proclaiming good news to the poor. I want you to take a, take a look at your church and the people that you know that are there, or your community, where are the poor? Where are the outcast? Are they in your church? And if not, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing about proclaiming good news to them? You know, to proclaim means to go to as well. And I'm afraid too many of us sit back and we say, come in. But whenever they don't come in, we just leave them out. But friends, we are called to proclaim. These are all action things. These are things for us to go do, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Friends, there are people around us that are 
captives to people, to addictions, to systems that they are within. And we are to bring hope. We are to bring light. We are to help set, free, set them free from those systems, from those people that they are being held captive from. You know, a lot of times when we think about that, we may think sex trafficking, you know, human trafficking, slavery, those kind of things. But there are, those are horrible offenses. And yes, we should be actively doing something about them. And as I tell people, find out what's on your heart. What is your passion? What breaks your heart? What makes you mad? And then be active to help doing something about it. Proclaim liberty. That means to set free the captives. And even in our jail system, there are captives there that are not where they should be. We need to remember that. And the Bible tells us to visit those that are in prison. And again, to bring light, to bring hope to them and to work for. If they're in there unjustly, then to work for their release. And too often I think we sit back and we say, well, they're in prison, they deserve it. But friends, there's a lot of people in a lot of situations that may have just been one bad choice that put them there. We need to recognize that. And I don't know about you, but I know myself, I've made some choices that should have probably either ended my life or put me in a lot worse situation than I am now. And it's only by the grace of God that they didn't. And so I believe that He calls us to stand up for those remembering that God has given us His grace. We don't always get what we deserve either. He's merciful. And so we need to also look at others and instead of pointing at them and saying they deserve it, to point at them and say, what if we showed them mercy? What if we work to help them, to bring light, to bring hope, to fight for life change for them? Thank God Jesus did that for us. The recovering of sight to the blind. You and I may not be able to make someone see visually what they, you know, if they're if they're physically blind, but we can open people's eyes through the power of the Holy Spirit to see what life is like with Jesus, to see hope, to see possibility, to be encouraged to see their way out of a situation that they don't see an end to. We ought to be bringing that sight to them. And to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Again, this and the captive sort of the same thing, but also the oppressed are those that are being taken advantage of. Those that are being unjustly treated. There's a lot of racial issues and things going on right now. And there's a lot of broken systems based on having money, based on not having money, based on skin color. We cannot be ignorant to these issues. We have to know that they exist. We have to agree that they exist. And as a church, as Christian people, as Jesus followers, we need to fight against those systems and help people escape from them instead of turning a blind eye i know things get uncomfortable i know it may, may mean people not agreeing with you but jesus had many people that did not agree with his message either jesus was in opposition to the righteous self-righteous church of his day and it cost him his life eventually. And he was persecuted. All of the disciples, all of the, the apostles, Jesus' followers, most of them anyway, were persecuted because they taught and lived what Jesus said. And if you and I teach and live what Jesus says, we're going to face persecution. 
but we need to be willing to get uncomfortable, myself included, and stand up for those that are being wrongly treated, that are oppressed by systems of injustice and inequality, and fight for the equality of all people, races, colors, class, gender, women, men. We all need to be on equal playing field. We all deserve that. We need to be fighting for that as a church and as people that claim Jesus Christ. And then it says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Friends, that's the good news. Because we believe in Jesus Christ, because we have accepted His love and His grace and His mercy and His forgiveness for ourselves, we have experienced His favor. And we get to share that with others. I always tell you, go and tell somebody else what God has done for you. How He has shown you His favor. How He has forgiven you and changed your life for the better. And how He's helped you experience that love and mercy that He offers. Friends, there is no better life than living one in the service of Jesus. I pray and I hope that you have experienced His love and His grace and His forgiveness for yourself. Friends, God loves us so much that He sent His own Son to die on a cross for us. To show us, to send us as poor captives that are blind, that are oppressed. To set us free. Because without Him, we are those things. We are poor. We are captives to sin. We are oppressed by systems. We are oppressed by Satan himself. And we are blind. And we need the Holy Spirit to open up our eyes to see that we are blind, that we are broken, that we are in need of forgiveness, that we are wrong. And Jesus, God sent Him to freely offer us His salvation and His love by trusting in Him. Not only did He die on a cross for us, but then He rose three days later to promise us and to show us proof of a future resurrection and a future day where we will be with Him. So friends, this is the Lord's favor on us. And this is the Lord's favor for all people that will trust in Him. So I pray, friends, that you would trust and believe in our Lord Jesus Christ for His salvation so that you too can be set free. Friends, I pray you have a wonderful day. Again, if you'd like to join us this evening, we invite you wherever you are. I'll post a Zoom link in the uh, description of this video so that you can join us. And let's go deeper into God's Word together. Friends, have a blessed day, a blessed week, and catch us during the week for our daily psalm so that you can be blessed and encouraged. Always my hope and prayer every day for you. Have a wonderful Sunday, friends.